So let's start with a few announcements. Uh, so simula uh, Simulation Lab 2 is posted. And what you'll notice is there is a, a pre-lab and a lab. Now the, the, the pre-lab is <clears throat> really an explanation of what you will be doing during the simulation lab. It gives some, some theory. Uh, it, it talks about how to solve the design problem in the pre-lab so that you can do the simulation lab itself. So just like the first lab, you'll be doing some calculations uh, and then you'll be doing simulation and, and you'll be comparing the two. And so, uh, so definitely take a look at, at the pre-lab. Uh, expect to spend some time on that. It's, it's several pages. Uh, read through it. Don't, don't just answer the problem because I think you're going to need that information uh, to, to do the lab efficiently. And if you want to ask some questions about the pre-lab or the lab, uh, then definitely get started early so we can chat. Um, so you will submit your pre-lab and your lab at the same time, right? So both of those get submitted. They're going to be uh, uh, two, two different uh, uploads to Canvas. So take a look at that. Let me know if you have any questions. Number two, the first exam will be on Thursday, uh, this Thursday, 6-11, during the lab block period. So I talked about during the last lecture that uh, we, I would assume that you had that time free. So instead of taking time during lecture and giving you an extra day to study here, uh, the exam will be held at 1 p.m. on Thursday, 6-11. I sent an announcement out about that on Canvas. And so you'll have, <clears throat> it's a one hour exam and you'll have a 30 minute grace period. So in reality, you'll have 30 minutes in order to, oh, I'm sorry, you'll have 90 minutes. You'll have um, an hour and a half uh, from 1 p.m. till 2.30 in order to turn in the exam. So that will be a PDF file um, and you'll download that from Canvas starting at 1 p.m. and then work the problem, uh, scan that, send it back <clears throat> via Canvas. And so the exam will be open book, open notes, uh, you will be bound by the honor code to work alone and not get any assistance or give any assistance. And the material that the exam will cover is through Thevenin equivalent circuits. So the material that we cover in the first part of class today will be covered on the exam on Thursday. Uh, you will have a chance to do your uh, homework on Thevenin equivalent circuits before the exam. So that will be some practice and you'll see the solutions to those also. So uh, let's see what else. Uh, there are practice problems on Canvas and review problems. They are under two different headings. So the, the practice problems <clears throat> are problems that kind of walk you through node voltage analysis and node voltages and Thevenin equivalents. The review problems are actually a few old exam problems so that you can get uh, a feel for what the exam problems are like. Okay, so. So take a look at that. And also keep an eye on, you've got several uh, uh, assignments due over the next couple days uh, to get you prepared for the exam. So take a look at that on Canvas. Uh, make sure you know when those are due. Okay, uh, any qu questions about the exam uh, before I go on? I, I had a quick question and it's not necessarily relating to the exam, but more the homeworks. Um, you had sent an email saying that you were changing the, the due times for the homeworks to match with the quizzes. Yeah. Um, and I believe it said all of them, but when I just checked on Canvas, it's still indicating that homework two and all subsequent homeworks that were not from last week hmm. are due okay. at 4 p.m. Okay, I, uh, I'll, I'll change that. Um, I thought that had gotten changed, but I'll take a thank you for letting me know. Uh, th so all the homeworks are due at 11.50, instead of 4 p.m., they're, they're due the same day at 11.59 p.m. Okay, yep. so, so yes, that's, that's true. Thanks for letting me know. No problem. Okay, any questions on the exam? Okay, so 
uh, my office hours will be right after class as normal. And uh, so come join if you want to either just ask a question or, or, or just listen into others' uh, questions. Um, if you have any questions during lecture, uh, shoot me a chat or uh, unmute if, if I miss your chat. Um, otherwise, please stay muted to keep the background uh, noise low. And if I drop off due to technical issues, uh, please wait and I'll try to get back. I'm still working on this uh, camera disconnect problem with my whiteboard. I've tried several different combinations and uh, uh, we'll see if the latest combination works. Okay, so what I wanted to do now is actually point out the course roadmap. So here's, here's where we are. We covered basic electrical theory and we'll finish up today with analysis of DC circuits when we finish up Thevenin and equivalence and maximum power transfer. And today we'll actually move on to uh, transient circuits, which are resistor capacitor and resistor inductor circuits. Um, so that's where we are in the course. And uh, that kind of kind of sets the perspective for what we will be doing. So what I'd like to do is bring back up the slides. We, we started an intro last time on uh, Thevenin and equivalent circuits. Okay, so right now you should see my slides on Thevenin and equivalent circuits and maximum power transfer. So, um, you know, I started I started introducing this last time by saying uh, if you have a linear circuit, uh, then that circuit has a certain current versus voltage response. Um, so let's suppose you have a linear circuit let's assume resistors and sources. And those sources can be dependent or uh, independent, either way. And if you take that uh, linear circuit and you, you connect a resistor, then, then you will get a certain voltage and current response across that resistor. In other words, you connected a load resistor, RL, and if you measure VL and measure IL, as you change RL, something interesting is going to happen. And, and here it is. If I plot voltage versus current, again, for this resistor, hold the, hold the linear circuit constant and, and take this resistor and just change its value. So, or, or start at a value. Um, there will be some voltage and current for that value of RL, right? So I put a dot here, that's, that's where it falls on the plot. If I take that resistance and I change it such that uh, I, I, I make it larger and bring it all the way up to infinity, which is an open circuit, then you would see zero amps. Uh, you would have no current flowing through an open circuit, infinite ohms by Ohm's law, and the voltage would rise um, and that voltage, we give a special name. It's called the open circuit voltage. So when I have infinite resistance or an open circuit connected to the output of this linear circuit, you're going to get this voltage VOC and the current is going to be zero through that resistance. If I go to the other extreme, so I take the resistance and I make it zero ohms, that's called a short circuit. So a short circuit between two terminals is zero ohms between those two terminals. If I short circuit the terminals, then I'll have zero volts between those terminals and the current will, will rise compared to what it was before. And, and what you would notice is that for every resistance uh, uh, in between, you would get a straight line. And so that, that those points, that line ranges from the open circuit voltage when the resistance is infinity to the short circuit current when the resistance is zero. Okay, so, so the open circuit voltage and the short circuit current uh, define that line. So if you know those two, then you know that line, right? It's, it's, it's going to be linear, it's gonna be straight, and for any value of resistance, you will fall on that line. There's an equation of that line, we could just derive that, it's just the equation of a line. So the load voltage uh, is equal to VOC, right, the offset, uh, plus the slope, which is minus VOC over ISC uh, uh, times IL. So that's, uh, all this is is the equation of that line, okay, V versus I. 
Okay, so so let's take a look at this uh, this relationship in order to determine an equivalent circuit. So what I'd like to do is take this maybe very complex circuit and simplify it into a very simple equivalent circuit, maybe for the purpose of analysis or maybe just to characterize that circuit. Okay, so we want an equivalent simple circuit to make analysis easier and maybe just to characterize it. And you know, what does it mean to be equivalent? It, it means that from the loads perspective, right, from this resistor's perspective, any circuit that has the same VL versus IL relationship uh, would be equivalent, right? So if I change this resistance to different values and V versus I behaves the same way, then, then the circuit's equivalent. Um, so let's define a variable that's commonly used, and this is going to represent uh, VOC over ISC. It's essentially uh, negative, the, the, the slope of that line. So we're going to define this R sub T. Uh, we're going to call this the Thevenin resistance, R sub T, and that's VOC over ISC. And so <clears throat> if I substitute in RT into VOC over ISC, I get this. I get VL equals VOC minus RT IL. And that that describes the behavior of that linear circuit when you connect a resistor to it. So let's draw, let's create a circuit that has the same VL versus IL relationship that we have here. Okay, so we want a circuit that does this. This is the equation I just showed. And uh, let's, let's try a circuit. Let's just try the circuit. So to the left of these terminals is the equivalent circuit. This is the circuit I am saying is equivalent to that very complex, maybe uh, linear circuit with resistors and sources. And, and I've simplified it significantly. I've, I've, I've represented that circuit with just a DC source, right? And a single resistor, RT. To the right of these terminals is the load resistor. That's the resistor we're varying to, 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 to watch this relationship happen. Okay, Let, let's see if the, the circuit is, is equivalent. So let's write a KVL equation. So if I write a KVL equation around this loop, right? let's start at the bottom left, go up minus VOC, plus ILRT, right, the, the current IL is going through RT, so the voltage is ILRT uh, plus VL equals zero. And let's rearrange this equation, this KVL a little bit, and I get a match. I, I, I get the same equation. Um, so as I vary that load resistance uh, on either one of these circuit, the complex circuit with resistors and sources, dependent or independent, so vary the resistance on that circuit and as I vary the resistance on this simple circuit with a single uh, uh, source and resistor, they have the same V versus I relationship as seen by that resistor. So as I mentioned before, we'll define RT to be the Thevenin resistance. A Thevenin resistance is RT. And we're going to define a special voltage, uh, VT, to be the Thevenin voltage. And VT is just this, VT is just equal to VOC. Uh, we, we, just, we just define it that way. So the Thevenin voltage is equal to the open circuit voltage. Okay, so um, let's talk about what this, let's roll this up into what this means. Any linear circuit with resistors and sources, either dependent or independent, um, is equivalent to a circuit that has just a voltage source and a resistor. Uh, if I put both of these in a box, in a black box, this complex circuit and its equivalent, and I give you a bunch of resistors and a voltmeter and an ammeter, you would not be able to tell the difference. You would, you would, uh, from measuring voltage and current based on different resistance values applied to the terminals, you couldn't tell the difference. So these circuits are equivalent from the perspective of anything connected to A and B. Inside they may be different, 
outside the box, just looking at the terminals, they're exactly the same. Okay. Um, so, you know, wh so why do this? Um, if, if you haven't, you know, if you haven't seen this, if you haven't figured out why are we doing all this work for an equivalent circuit, well, here's, here's one reason. Suppose you need to find the power delivered to a load resistor. So I have this circuit, complex circuit, right? And I have to find the power delivered to this resistor when it's connected to the terminals, right? And let's suppose I have five different load resistor values, okay? And okay, that's fine. I'd have to analyze the circuit five times. But, but what if the circuit's really complicated, right? What if it's just a, a mess? Um, and you don't, you don't really want to analyze the circuit five times to figure out how much power is delivered to that load resistor. If, let's suppose you're trying to create a plot of power delivered to the load resistor versus load resistance. That would be analyzing the circuit many, many times or parameterizing it, figuring out equations. Okay, so you'd need to analyze that circuit five times or you analyze the circuit once. You still have to go through that. You have to analyze the circuit once and calculate the Thevenin equivalent. Okay, so now uh, from the resistor's perspective, from the load resistor's perspective, this single, the single source and series resistor is equivalent to this complex circuit. Okay, so once I do that, uh, that process once, then I can analyze this circuit, the simple circuit five times. It's much easier to change this load resistor to five values or 10 values or 100 values, right? And, 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 and calculate, uh, let's say, current and power for it uh, uh, versus analyzing this other circuit five times. Um, that's one value of the Thevenin equivalent. Uh, another value is being able to mm, characterize how this complex circuit is just going to behave when you connect something to it. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but this is why the back of your stereo next to the speakers might say 8 ohms or 4 ohms or 16 ohms. That's why the back of your television says 75 ohms uh, near the, uh, the coax connector, near the F connector. Okay, so that's, that's, why, that's a motivation of why we do this. Okay, so let's talk about how to calculate the Thevenin equivalent. It's, it's not all that complicated. It's actually... Um, a simple uh, few step process. So I like to say step one, first write down the answer and fill in the blanks. <clears throat> so you're gonna write the answer, here's the answer. That is the Thevenin equivalent and the blanks that you will have to fill in are VT and RT. Okay, so let's first work on finding VT. <clears throat> well, uh, if you have this linear circuit with resistors and sources, dependent or independent, um, the Thevenin equivalent, uh, the Thevenin voltage is just equal to the open circuit voltage between terminals A and B. Okay, all this means is don't connect anything to the terminals, right? You have some circuit in here, it has some schematic, you have two terminals exposed. Don't connect anything, don't put any load resistor, right? Or I guess you could say apply an infinite load resistor, but just don't connect anything and calculate or measure or simulate VOC. Okay, so once you find that, once you get that value, that is VT. Okay, that's, and then you, and then you write it up here next to the voltage source. Uh, then the next step is to find the Thevenin resistance. And so there are two ways to do this. Uh, there's a, a way that always works, and then there's a little easier way that uh, works some of the time. So let's talk about both of those. First is the way that always works. Uh, you calculate the short circuit current, right? Uh, and you know the open circuit voltage from the prior step and RT equals VOC over ISC, right? I, a few slides ago, I said, this is just the slope of that line. All we're trying to do is find the slope of that line, V over I, and that's what RT is. So, so if you know VOC, right, the left side of that plot on the, the vertical axis, and ISC, the right side of the plot on the horizontal axis. If you know those two, then you know the slope. Okay, so what's that mean in practice? That means uh, to find ISC, you actually apply a short circuit. You just apply a wire. You put a wire from A to B, a zero ohm resistor, and then you calculate 
ISC. Okay, so you do some maybe KVL, KCL, node voltage analysis, whatever. You've got a circuit in here, and you'd have to figure out through this wire uh, what what the current is. Uh, you can do this in practice through measurement, although some circuits really don't like uh, having their terminals shorted. Don't try this with a car battery. Um, so, so sometimes you have to do other things. You can't directly, you cannot sometimes directly measure ISC, but you can always calculate it. You can always simulate it. Okay, this is the method that always works, and it's not that hard, but method two is usually a little easier. Um, but this method works only when you only have independent sources. So if the sources has only independent sources, that means circles, that means circles, no diamonds, right? No diamonds in your circuit. If you only have independent sources, you set all of the sources to zero. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. And then calculate the equivalent resistors, uh, equivalent resistance. And then REQ equals RT between the terminals. Okay, this is like series and parallel combinations uh, once you zero the sources. I'll, I'll do an example of this and I'll, I'll tell you what this means. But, but just to summarize in a picture, so any, any, any linear circuit with resistors and independent sources, circles, no diamonds, you take, you take all of those values of the sources, the voltages you set to zero volts, the currents you set to zero amps, and then you look into the terminals or between the terminals, you calculate or measure the equivalent resistance and that's RT. Okay, so, so these are the steps uh, to calculate the Thevenin equivalent circuit. And what's that mean? That means draw the circuit, calculate VT, calculate RT, you're done. Um, let's, let's talk about what it means to set the sources to zero. Uh, well, for a zero volts or for a voltage source, you set that source to zero volts. Now, a zero volt source is equivalent to a short, a wire, right? If I, if I have a zero volt source or if I have a wire, right, a short circuit connected between these two terminals, in both cases, I have zero volts between those two terminals, okay? For an, uh, a current source, if I set the current to zero amps, another way to do that is to apply an open circuit between those terminals. So if I have zero amps flowing through a source, it's just like having, well, zero amps flowing through an open circuit. Both of these do the same thing. Okay, so now you wind up with no sources in your circuit. You've replaced all of the uh, zero volt sources with shorts, all of the open, uh, all of the uh, zero amp sources with opens. And so you're left with no more sources, right? There are no diamonds. Um, there, there are only independent uh, current sources and voltage sources. So then, so when all the sources are independent, you replace the independent voltage sources with shorts, right? Just like up here. You replace the independent current sources with opens, like right here. Uh, and then you calculate REQ between the terminals, uh, just just like uh, you would do with series and parallel elements. And and so someone said, how do you calculate VOC and ISC? So we'll do an example of that. Um, what what you do is you. Um, so we're going to have a circuit, and we're going to just just can calculate uh, the voltage between two of the nodes. You just that's what you do to calculate calculate VOC. You have two nodes, A and B, and calculate the voltage, KVL, KCL, Ohm's law, um, volt, uh, voltage division, current division, you know, node voltage analysis. To calculate ISC, it's just like calculating the current through a wire, just like you're doing in homework. You, you're you're calculating, calculating the current through a wire. That wire happens to be one that you added to the circuit. Uh, and you'll know what's inside this box when I show you an example inside that complicated uh, circuit. Not so complicated. Um, okay, so so let's do this. Let's do this now. Uh, let's fire up the whiteboard and do an example. Okay, and then and so definitely uh, shout out if my if if I don't catch after a few seconds that my whiteboard goes away. Definitely give a shout out. 
Okay, uh, can, let me, let me stop sharing. Okay, and, and so can everybody see uh, my whiteboard like full screen? Excellent, okay. So here, here's an example. Let's suppose I have this circuit. This is the circuit in, inside the box. And, and uh, there are two terminals, A and B. Let's put B down here. And so what I would like to do is I would like to find the Thevenin equivalent circuit of this hmm, more complicated circuit, I'll say. And, and, and so let's do that. So the first thing you do is you, you draw the Thevenin equivalent, right? Step one, I want to create a Thevenin equivalent circuit, which has terminals A and B. It has a uh, voltage VT and Thevenin resistance RT. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking to solve for those two values. Okay, so uh, let's, let's figure out VT first. Let's solve for VT. Okay, um, VT is equal to the open circuit voltage. So what that means is between terminals A and B, uh, don't apply anything, don't apply a load resistor with, with any uh, value except for infinity, just leave, leave terminals A and B open and calculate the voltage. So I want the voltage here, this is VOC, and that's what VT is. Okay, so that's what we're going to figure out. Okay, so now this is just a circuits problem. I, I want to figure out uh, the voltage across that 40 ohm resistor, right? Because that 40 ohm resistor connects between A and B. So the way I would solve this, I would try voltage division. Okay, so let's use voltage division. And so voltage division will, will let me do this. Um, I have a 12 volt source across three series resistors, right? When there's nothing connected to A and B, the same current flows through all of these resistors, right? So as long as there's, as there's nothing connected there, those resistors are in series. Okay, so, so let's use voltage division. So VOC equals, the source of voltage across the series set of resistors times the ratio of the resistance across which you want to find uh, the voltage divided by the sum of all of the series resistors. Okay. And so what's that equal? That equals eight volts. Okay, so, so that's, it was as simple as that. Um, you could do this other ways. You could say, well, I know the equivalent resistance is, is uh, I don't know, 60 ohms there. So 12 volts over 60 ohms gives me the current through the 40 ohm resistor, use ohms law. There are different ways to do this. You might use node voltage analysis, but, uh, but, but either way, you're gonna get eight volts for VOC. And so I can come over here and I can write eight volts. So that's, that's the, the, the Thevenin voltage um, for the circuit. Okay, and so, now let's um, let's do this. Let, let's find RT. So RT, uh, we can find two ways. Um, we can use uh, VOC over ISC, or we can use um, zeroing out the sources and calculating the equivalent resistance. We can do either one of those because I have only independent sources. If I had a diamond in here, then I would have to calculate ISC and use that approach. But since I have an independent source only, uh, let's use the easier approach, what's usually the easier approach first. Okay, so let's redraw this circuit uh, in, in the form uh, of having a zero volt source. Now remember, when you have a, when you have a zero volt source, that's just like having a short, right? Because I have plus minus zero volts across a short. So I can uh, draw the circuit 
like this. So I have 40 ohms, 10 ohms, 10 ohms, right, like that, terminal A, terminal B. And so what I want to do is I, I like to say, look into those terminals. What you're really doing is, is you're measuring between A and B or ca you're calculating between A and B the value of REQ, okay? It's really like you're, it's really like you're applying a voltage and measuring a current uh, at the A, B, A and B terminals uh, so that you can find the equivalent resistance, okay? So what I can do is from the, from the perspective of these terminals, uh, let's see, these combine in series to 20 ohms, right? And then so I have, uh, f uh, let's see, the 40 ohm resistor and this 20 ohm resistor are effectively in parallel now, or they are in parallel. They both connect the terminals A and B. So I get, uh, let's see, 40 in parallel with those parallel lines, I mean parallel, I mean that up a bit. So we get 40 in parallel with 20, and that equals 13.3 ohms, okay? So, so now I know my Thevenin equivalent circuit. This is 13.3 ohms up here. So if I take a, if I take this circuit, the original circuit and I put it in a black box and I expose two wires and I give it to you, or I put an eight volt source and a 13.3 ohm resistor in a black box in series and expose those to two terminals. And I give you a variable resistor, maybe a potentiometer or a set of resistors and a voltmeter and an ammeter, you would not be able to tell the difference uh, between these two circuits. Okay, so from the outside world, they're the same. Okay. Um, there was a question about well how do you, how do you calculate ISC so let's let's do this let's let's um, check our answer let's go back and calculate RT another way okay so um, let's suppose we want to use the approach where where I calculate the short circuit current so I actually have to draw the circuit over again let's do that oop lost my video again. Okay, so let's draw that, that over again. I, I have a source. Ten ohm resistor, another ten ohm resistor. Forty ohm resistor. That says forty ohms. Ten ohms. Ten ohms. And my original terminals, A and B. But but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, sh well short the terminals. I'm going to draw a wire, right? And that current that goes through that wire from A to B is ISC. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's see. Why did I say that the? This is a good question. I get this every once in a while, and it's it's a great question. Why do you say that the? they are in parallel when getting RT, but you say they're in series when getting VOC. Okay. That is a, that's a, that's a great question. It's all about where you're measuring or where the source is. Let me, let me go back and, so we'll put this on hold for a second because this is an important uh, point here. In this circuit, in this original circuit, um, when I, if I just turn the circuit on and I don't connect anything, I don't connect anything to the terminals, I'm going to have current flowing out of the source through both resistors, right, down through the 40 ohm and back. So the same current, the same current flows through the 10 ohm resistor, the 10 ohm resistor, and the 40 ohm resistor. Okay, so they're in series. Now, Let's go back here. Let me let me redraw this circuit uh, for a minute. So I have th this circuit that looks like this. It has uh, 10 ohms. Let me give myself a little more space. It has 10 ohms, 
10 ohms and 40 ohms. And these two terminals. And I was trying to find uh, R E Q looking into those terminals between terminals A and B. Okay. Let's think about what it means to have an equivalent resistance. It 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 means this. It means I'm going to take I'm going to take uh, something like a voltage source. Okay, and this is what an ohmmeter does. It applies a voltage, uh, and I'm going to measure the current. And R E Q equals V over I. Okay, so so in this case. When I look at the equivalent resistance, when I'm calculating it, I'm considering these two terminals, applying a voltage, and calculating V over I. This is just what we did when we looked at calculating uh, the equivalent resistance of series and parallel resistors. We did the same thing, uh, and, and we calculated V over I. So let's do the same thing here. Well, this I is, is now coming into A, and it splits. It goes down through the 40, and it goes through the 10. It goes down this way, and comes back, and it joins, and goes back to the source. So, so the the current in the original um, problem, right in the original schematic, that current was caused by this 12 volt source, and there was no place else for it to go. It had to circulate around this loop. When I've zeroed this uh, 12 volt source, and now I calculate the equivalent resistance using uh, well another source, effectively and calculating V over I, the current that I'm considering is this, uh, is, is this current I, which can split between the 40 ohm resistor and the two 10 ohm resistors. Okay, does that make sense? Answer the question. So I have a question. Sure. You can, because the, the two 10 ohms are in series, because they're sharing the same circuit, or the same current, um, could you just add those together and make it 20 ohms? Yes. And it? Okay. Yeah. In fact, that's what I did right here. That's why I wrote 20 okay. ohms on the. And, and in fact, you could say, you could say this is 20 ohms, and then the equivalent resistance is equal to. Uh, you could you could write it this way. You could say, uh, uh, let me write it, uh, 40 in par. Oops, that's not a 40. You could say it's 40 in parallel with 10 plus 10 or 40 in parallel with 20, either the either Okay, way. cool. And mm -hmm. then could you come back to how you calculated VOC? Mm -hmm. So VOC is calculated using voltage division. So I have three series resistors. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so last time we talked about when you have uh, uh, series resistors, if you want to find the the voltage uh, across one of those resistors, right? So the voltage between here and here is VOC. It's the voltage across that 40 ohm resistor. Okay. Uh, and, and so you can do that using voltage division, where uh, the voltage across that resistor is equal to the voltage across the whole series set times the ratio of, on top is the uh, uh, resistance across which you want to find the voltage and the bottom is the sum of all the resistances. Okay, so, and if, if that doesn't ring a bell, take a look back at the, at the notes that we, we um, it's actually in the slides about voltage division and you'll see that we had three resistors and okay. the third resistor at the bottom was R3 and that's how we calculated it. Yeah, okay, I just, I went back to an old okay. lecture and saw the equation. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome, good question. Okay, other questions on this? Um, uh, I think you just mentioned it, but um, uh, how do you uh, pick the, the 40 in the VOC equation? Uh, I'm having trouble with that. Okay, um, so uh, and, any other questions on, on this schematic before I erase it right here? Okay, let's, let's talk about that. So. So what we have, if I draw it more like we had in class, uh, when we derived the voltage division um, equation. So, so first let me ask this, do you see that the voltage we're looking for is between A and B? 
So the voltage we're looking for is, I'm gonna circle this in green, I hope you can see it. Uh, the voltage we're looking for is between these two nodes. And so VOC is the voltage between the top node and the bottom node. And the voltage across that 40 ohm resistor is between the top node and the bottom node. So we're looking for the voltage across the 40 ohm resistor, okay? And so in voltage division, we, we drew it in class like this. We had three series resistors like this. Um, and, and then uh, if, I, if, I, if I break these resistors in, this would be uh, 10 ohms, 10 ohms, and 40 ohms. Right, and VOC is the voltage across the 40 ohm resistor. So I'm looking for this voltage plus minus VOC. Okay. Does that make sense that VOC is across the 40 ohm resistor? Uh, yeah, it makes uh, more sense now. Okay, good. And then if, if um, and so once you uh, relate this schematic to something that looks like this, now this is, is directly what we drew in class for, uh, for voltage division. So you can take a look at that. And again, another way to do this is you have 12 volts um, uh, across 60 ohms. You could calculate this current, let's just call it IX, and VOC equals IX ohms law times 40 ohms. You can do that too. If you don't like voltage division, you can, you can do that either way. Okay. Okay. So, uh, good questions. So let's let's go back to looking at. Uh, so we calculated RT one way. We use the equivalent resistance approach. Now let's do it the other way. Let's calculate RT using this um, short circuit current approach. And and so what we want we want RT we want to find RT and that's VOC over ISC. We know VOC, it's eight volts. We have to figure out ISC in order to calculate RT. Okay, so, um, so let's find ISC. So ISC is the current when you take this original circuit and you apply a short between the terminals. And so that's what I did here. And, uh, and so, you know, there's different ways to look at this problem on how to find ISC. Let, let's, um, let's see. If I've applied um, uh, zero volts, well, let me say this. If I've applied a short across terminals A and B, okay, that means that from here to here, I have zero volts, a short circuit, is a zero ohm resistor by Ohm's law, you have zero volts between those terminals. That means that this 40 ohm resistor has zero volts across it, right? It's connected to those same two nodes. By Ohm's law, coming down through this 40 ohm resistor is zero amps. That's a zero amps. Okay. Uh, right, zero volts across the 40 ohm resistor means zero amps through that resistor. Okay, uh, that means that, so I have coming out of this terminal, this is ISC, right? Because that's, that's what I've drawn here. If zero amps is going down through this 40 ohm resistor, again, because there's zero volts across it, then if you do a mental uh, Kirchhoff's, uh, Kirchhoff's current law in this area, then the current ISC, that's ISC, is also flowing through these 10 ohm resistors, right? ISC comes out of the source, zero goes down through the 40 ohm resistor because there's zero volts across it, and all the ISC current comes down and back to the source. Okay, so, so that lets us uh, write a uh, kind of a, a, a neat equation here, a neat equation. Um, I can now write a KVL equation where the voltage across these 10 ohm resistors uh, is ISC times 10, okay? So let me write a KVL equation. So my KVL says, I'm gonna start here, the lower left, minus 12, right, minus 12, plus ISC times 10 ohms, 
right? That's the voltage by Ohm's law, the voltage across that 10 ohm resistor. Plus, again, ISC times 10 ohms, sorry, 10 ISC, right? Uh, and I'm back to the starting point, equals zero. Okay, so now I can say that uh, ISC equals 12 over 20, right? I think I did that right, which is 0 0.6 amps. Okay, so now I have ISC and I can, I can plug into the equation for RT, RT equals VOC, 8 volts. Save my units for the final answer. Uh, RT is equal to 8 volts over ISC, 0 0.6 amps, and that equals 13.3 ohms. Okay, so you get the same answer uh, either way. The approach on the right was a little longer. The approach on the left is pretty simple, but you can only do the approach on the left when you have all independent sources. If you have any diamonds, then you cannot do this. Uh, under the review problems on Canvas, I've posted an example of a Thevenin equivalent circuit with a dependent source. So you can see how that works. I've also uh, posted, take a look at the practice problems. I think there are pr uh, practice problems uh, related to Thevenin equivalent. So you can take a look at that. So what this comes down to is, again, to bring it full circle, this original circuit uh, can be represented, can be characterized by its Thevenin equivalent circuit from the perspective of connecting anything, really, to terminals A and B. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? So let's uh, let's talk about another important aspect of Thevenin equivalent circuits, and the topic is maximum power transfer, and this helps to explain uh, why the back of your television says 75 ohms near the RF connector and the back of your stereo says 8 ohms. Uh, let's see here. Let me make sure my video is stopped. I think it's stopped itself. Okay, so now you should be able to see my, my slides. Um, and so let's talk about maximum power transfer. Let's talk about power transfer at all from a source to a load. So let's suppose that you have a realistic source. And oh, I can't see the slides, sorry. Oh, you, you cannot. Hmm, let's try this again. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. How about now, can you see them? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I wish Zoom had some feedback. I, I wish I had a, a screen I could dedicate to what everybody else sees. I think I'm going to take another laptop and I'm going to be another guest so I can see what you see. I'll put it off to the side. Actually, I think that's. I think I might do that next time. Um, but let me know if, if I'm talking about something that you can't see. So um, let's suppose you have a realistic source, non-ideal, right? By source, I don't mean an independent ideal voltage source or current source. I mean like a battery or like a, a, a microphone output or like an antenna output. And let's suppose you want to transfer the most power possible to a load, okay? And, and so there's several reasons you might want to do this, but let's, let's set up the situation in a schematic. So here is a Thevenin equivalent circuit it's, remember, it represents any linear circuit with sources and resistors, and it turns out that non-ideal sources like antennas, like, like audio amplifiers, um, like sensor outputs, they're modeled very well by a Thevenin equivalent circuit because they're linear. They act like, a, they act like sources and resistors. So on the left, this Thevenin equivalent cir circuit, I am calling my realistic source. So that's why I put it in quotes. This is the source. This is what's providing maybe a signal output. The load is what's receiving that signal output. So on the left side, that might be an antenna. On the right side, that might be your television. On the left side, 
uh, that might be a, a, a sensor, like a temperature sensor on the right side, that might be a data acquisition device, okay? And it's, it's usually desirable to get high power transfer to your load so that you have the best signal power. Because you have, for a given noise power, you want the highest signal power. You may have heard of signal to noise ratio. You want a high signal to noise ratio. So an example of power transfer, again, is audio amplifier to a speaker. Audio amplifier is the realistic source. The speaker is the load. Uh, a sensor, maybe a temperature sensor, strain gauge, something to a data acquisition device. The sensor is the source. The data acquisition device is the load. An electric guitar um, for musicians and audiophiles, right? That's, that's uh, uh, the source. The amplifier input is the load or for you uh, ham radio operators and um, uh, RF radio frequency enthusiasts, uh, an antenna is a source and a receiver is a load. And so let's figure out uh, what the power delivered to the load is. Let's figure out an equation for that. So let me define the voltage across the load and the current through the load. And then let's calculate the power delivered to the load. So that's just I times V. It's just a resistor, I times V. Let's, um, let's then use Ohm's law to figure out the current. So I have uh, a voltage VT applied across two series resistors, RT plus RL. So the current is the voltage divided by the equivalent resistance. Okay, so the voltage VT divided by the equivalent resistance, that's the current going through the load. Okay, and so now let's use voltage division to uh, figure out what the voltage across the load is related to VT. So that's just a voltage divider. We have series resistors, RT and RL, and you're trying to figure out the voltage across RL, and we have VT across both resistors. So it's VT times RL over RT plus RL. And so now multiply these two together, right? Multiply IL times VL, and you get this. The power delivered to the load is uh, the Thevenin voltage times the load resistance divided by the Thevenin plus load resistance squared. Okay, you know, a thing to note about this equation. So let's say you have a fixed source. You have, you know, your, your stereo is set at a particular volume and it has so many volts out and you want to know uh, what load resistor do you connect or what load speaker, what, what ohm speaker do you connect to your stereo to get the maximum power transfer to that speaker? You can see from this equation that if VT and RT are held constant, if you change RL, then PL changes. Okay, so the, the power delivered to the load is affected by the load resistance. Okay, so maximum power transfer, um, you, you could figure out like this. So here's the, the source and the load. And let's look at the extreme examples of, of changing the load resistance and, 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 and see what happens. So if I make a table, if I create a table, I'm gonna vary the load resistance. I'm gonna figure out what VL and IL are and calculate PL. And so uh, if the load resistance is zero ohms, then of course I have a short across the load. Uh, I have zero volts and it doesn't matter what the load current is. It's gonna be the short circuit current, but it doesn't matter what that current is. You're gonna have zero watts delivered to the load. So if RL is zero ohms, you get the, uh, you get uh, zero watts delivered to the load. Go to the other extreme. If you have infinity ohms or an open circuit, um, then you're gonna have zero amps flowing through the load and you also have zero watts. So we've narrowed it down. I like to say we've narrowed it down such that the answer for load resistance for maximum power falls somewhere between zero and infinity, right? So that's a big help. But, but what I really want to point out is that even though you have a current flowing when you have zero ohms through RL, in fact, that's the maximum current that will flow when you have zero ohms, you have zero power delivered to the load. So, so no sound comes out of the speakers if there's zero ohms, uh, the resistance doesn't get hot, your data acquisition device doesn't see any 
any sensor value. Same thing for uh, infinity ohms. Um, if you're not delivering any, uh, if, you're, if your current is zero, then you're not delivering any power. Okay, so let's, let's just glance at the calculus approach. Uh, you could do this. So here's the equation we derived on the prior slide. And you know that from calculus, in order to find the maximum of a function, I could set uh, its derivative with respect to whatever the independent variable is equal to zero uh, and solve for RL. So you can do that. And what you'll find is this. Let me show it on a graph. Uh, so if you, if you look at um, uh, a graph of this circuit, right? So I've filled in some values. Let's say you have a 10 volt Thevenin voltage and a 100 ohm Thevenin resistance, and you're going to vary R sub L between zero and infinity, or let's just say a thousand. Then what you get is a plot like this, right? At, at, at zero ohms, right? This is load resistance. This is power delivered to the load. At zero ohms, you get zero power delivered. That's that makes sense from the last slide from our table. And then as you approach infinity, right, the power keeps falling. And as you approach infinity, the power goes down to zero as the resistance heads toward infinity. Well, you can see there's a peak. There's a very distinct peak right here. And, and that peak happens right here at 100 ohms. And so it's not a coincidence that this peak happens at 100 ohms and that the Thevenin resistance is 100 ohms. Um, and what that, what that says is this. So if you took the calculus approach, you'd prove this in general, but we've demonstrated it here with one case. Uh, this, this is the big takeaway right here. For maximum power transfer, uh, what, what you do is you set RL equal to RT. Okay, so you have, you have a certain source, a realistic source with a Thevenin voltage and a Thevenin resistance, and you want to maximize power transfer to RL, then set RL equals RT. So if the back of your stereo says eight ohms at the speaker output, you want to attach an eight ohm speaker to get maximum power transfer. If you look at the back of your maybe satellite receiver, that's an output that goes to your television. The, the output, the RF cable would say 75 ohms. And the back of your television hopefully says 75 ohms. You want to match those um, resistances. The, the, we'll talk about impedance, but you call it in general an impedance, but you want the, uh, the, the output resistance of your source to equal the input uh, resistance of your load. And so an antenna, if you have an antenna, they're usually, uh, except for television, they're usually 50 ohms. They look like a 50 ohm uh, resistor at, uh, they look like they have a Thevenin resistance of 50 ohms at radio frequencies where they're designed to operate. And so you want to connect that antenna to a receiver that looks like a 50 ohm resistor at radio frequencies. Okay. So, uh, so th what we've just covered is Thevenin equivalent circuits model linear circuits, right? Resistors and sources. Um, we talked about how to calculate the Thevenin equivalent. And then we talked about once you have a Thevenin equivalent or you know the Thevenin resistance, how to achieve maximum power transfer from that Thevenin equivalent source to a load. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes. So should I know how to derive that? Should I know that equation that we just uh, covered for the power of the load? Um, for this one right here? Yes. You should know that. I mean, you should, you should know, uh, you, you know, you could either, if, if, if you have exactly the circuit, then you can just use this equation. Um, if you forget this equation, then you can go back one more slide and you can just use Ohm's law and voltage division and then multiply I times V and you get that equation. So you should, you should be able to do that, yes. And to derive um, when the power, uh, power transfers are maximum, should I, or should I just, the takeaway is that I know that when the resistances are equal, that is when the maximum power is transferred in the load. Yeah, so you can just use the takeaway. 
you can just use the takeaway that when you want to maximize power transfer, set RL equal to RT. You don't have to worry about uh, taking the derivative of this and then setting it equal to zero and then solving for RL. So don't, don't worry about that. Uh, just, just concentrate on the big takeaway, uh, set RL equal to RT. Okay, thank you. Sure thing. Okay, other questions? Okay, um, so what we've what we've done now is we've at this point we have completed the uh, the DC portion of the course. So now you know how to analyze DC circuits and uh, create some equivalents for series and parallel resistors, and also create Thevenin equivalent circuits. So the next topic is going to be first order circuits. And so what I'd like to do now, since it's kind of a big change of gears. A, a, a big, big uh, uh, brain shift is uh, let's actually let's take a break now. So let's take a 10 minute break and when we come back I'm going to start on first order circuits. Uh, so it is my clock says 502 right now. Uh, so let's do this let's let's round up to 503. Let's come back at uh, 513 and we will start back into first order circuits and uh, continue the class then. So see you in about 10 minutes. Okay, let's get, let's get started back up. Uh, can someone confirm that you can hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. <clears throat> so it, um, I'm showing a slide right now uh, showing uh, a first order circuit. So we're going to talk about circuits with resistors and capacitors and inductors. So here are a couple of resistors up at the top. Uh, this is an example of an electrolytic capacitor down at the bottom. This, this coil of wire is an inductor. And so these, um, these circuit elements, when put together, they help you do things like make audio filters, make RF filters, so you can pass certain frequencies and stop certain frequencies. Capacitors are energy, just, uh, energy storage devices, so you can have short-term storage of energy uh, for, let's say, holding uh, memory while a battery is taken out of a device. Um, you, you can also do things uh, like, like create uh, integrators and differentiators with op-amp circuits. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get there. But but these are useful devices, uh, capacitors and inductors, because of their I versus V relationship. <clears throat> right? Ohm's law said that resistors have an I versus V relationship, and that was important um, well, for Ohm's law problems. We'll see it's more important when we get to op-amps. But uh, we're going to see that the capacitors and the inductors have a derivative and an integral relationship, so you can do even more things with those. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to uh, the whiteboard. Okay, so, so now you should be seeing uh, my whiteboard, and I've drawn a capacitor. And so this is a, a cartoon of a capacitor, but it's actually a pretty accurate uh, cartoon. If you take uh, two pieces of metal, two conducting plates, and you separate those conducting plates uh, by an insulator, that insulator could be air, it could be ceramic. Um, there, there are different reasons to do, use different insulators. Uh, you've actually created a capacitor. There's no electrical connection. There's no way for current to flow from one plate to another, to the other, because there's an insulator in between. And so that forms a, a capacitor. And so if we look at what's happening here, <clears throat> the, the schematic symbol for a capacitor looks like this. Um, let's consider what happens if you take a capacitor, you put it together, you just, you, you create it, you take two parallel plates, connect wires, put them together, um, and then you apply a voltage, okay? So let's suppose that we have uh, a 
the voltage defined V and that voltage starts off at zero, zero volts. And then you start increasing V in the positive direction. What actually happens is you get uh, uh, positive charges accumulating on the top plate and negative charges accumulating on the bottom plate. And the reason that is you have, you have positive charges trying to leave that negative side of V to go back to, let's say, the source, uh, <clears throat> leaving an absence of positive charges. And there's an electric field in here. I'm, I'm just going to write E field <clears throat> because of the charges. Okay, so uh, that leaves a, a net charge on the capacitor. And you can actually figure out what that is. Uh, applying a voltage causes that charge to happen. And the amount of charge is equal to C times V, where C is the capacitance of the capacitor. Okay, so what this says, all this equation says, is that the amount of charge that's stored in the capacitor is proportional to the voltage across the capacitor. And that proportionality constant is C. And that's all that is. C is actually called the capacitance. And its units are farads. And so what you'll see, you'll see in uh, common electronic components, you'll see microfarads or, or picofarads or nanofarads. Okay, so there is a very small value. The capacitance itself is actually a function of the geometry and the materials of the capacitor. And so you don't, we're not going to get into this, but just to show you, uh, the capacitance is equal to epsilon A over D, where epsilon is a, a dielectric constant. Um, A is the area of the plates and D is the separation between the plates. This is a distance, this is an area. Um, epsilon has to do with what material the insulator or the dielectric is. Okay, so you can vary the capacitance by varying these values, but for a given capacitor, it, it, this doesn't change. For, for a given capacitor, the capacitance is set. Okay, so you might have a one microfarad capacitor and that means that the charge stored is proportional to voltage and the proportionality constant is one times 10 to the negative sixth. Okay, so, um, so uh, capacitors are actually storing energy. You've stored charge. If you disconnect this capacitor, there's still a voltage across the capacitor. Uh, it has the potential to do work. It is, it is actually storing energy. What we're typically interested in uh, is the time varying variables associated with this equation. So if I, if I take the uh, derivative uh, dq dt, let's say that q changes with time, v changes with time, uh, c is a constant. Um, so dq dt, c is a constant, it comes out of the derivative, equals c dv dt, And we know from, I think, day one of the lecture that dq dt is current flow, right? The, 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 the rate of change of charge through a conductor uh, with respect to time is current. So this is the, uh, the big takeaway equation. Right? Current equals C dv dt for a capacitor. Okay, so that's that's something that's something to take away. Um, so, uh, question says uh, the amount of charge stored in the capacitor is proportional to the voltage stored in that capacitor. I'm going to state that a different way. I'm going to say that the charge is stored in the capacitor and the voltage is applied across the capacitor. That's true. Yes. So if I apply a voltage across the capacitor, the charge stored is proportional to that. Um, and then when you have a time varying voltage that actually causes a current to flow. 
Okay, so wait a minute. I said that there's an insulator in between here. How is current flowing if there's an insulator in between these two plates? Well, in reality, the charge itself is not crossing the insulator. It's just that charge is getting stored. So as charge is getting stored, as voltage is increasing, more and more charge is getting stored. So it looks from the outside world like current is flowing into this capacitor. And then maybe you have the voltage go the other direction, the other slopes, so that the current is negative and then flows out of the capacitor. We'll see when we get to AC circuits that that's what happens with the capacitor. The capacitor stores up with one polarity and then it discharges, goes back to zero, and then it uh, stores charge, charge with another polarity and then goes back to zero and it alternates. But, uh, but it looks like from the outside world, from the terminals of the capacitor, that that current is flowing. So when you have, there's a couple takeaways here, when you have a, a DC voltage, uh, uh, a, a DC voltage has a zero derivative, right? So dVdt for like six volts is zero, so you have zero current. That's consistent with having an insulator. If I apply six volts, there's an initial transient that we're gonna talk about, but once the voltage stabilizes, uh, there's a charge stored and no current flows. Okay, um, so, so that that this is this is a big equation that relates current versus voltage for a capacitor. We're going to use that a lot. You can turn this around and you could say, well, this is great if I know if I know voltage, I want to find current. What if I know current and I want to find voltage? Well, you can do that by taking the integral of both sides. So if I again take the integral multiply by one over c, you get v of t equals one over c times the integral of some some start time, so you have to have some start time, t0, when you start integrating, uh, to some current time, t, right? So some time in the past to some current time, t, and then you're going to integrate uh, uh, current, and I'm gonna create a, a variable of integration. Sometimes tau is used there. It just It's just another variable for integrating over time. So d tau, and then you have to have an initial condition, a starting point. This is the constant in the integral. Okay, so this bottom equation is just the integral of the top equation uh, with the integration constant on the right. Okay, so those are big takeaways. Um, let's take a look at uh, a case where I have an AC voltage, a time varying voltage applied across a capacitor. Okay, so I'm going to, any questions on, on this before I erase it and do an example problem? Okay. So let's work, let's do an example problem. Let's suppose that you have an AC voltage applied directly across a capacitor. So I have some capacitor and it has a value uh, C of, of 10 microfarads. Let's write it down here. So that's what C is. And let's suppose, suppose I'm applying voltage V of T. And V of T equals sine 10 to the sixth T. <clears throat> so it's a sine wave, it just varies with time, sinusoidally. And so let's find I of T, where I of T is the current flowing into the positive side of V of T, just like we defined it. Okay, so um, this is a direct application of I of T equals C dV dT. And so what we can do is we can say uh, this equals C 10 times 10 to the negative sixth, right? That's C, 10 microfarads, times uh, dV dt. So if I take the 
derivative of sine, I get uh, 10 to the sixth cosine, 10 to the sixth T. So the current is 10 cos 10 to the 6t. Okay, so I have a sine wave voltage and I have a cosine current and cosine is just a sine shifted by 90 degrees. So you get a, a, another sinusoid but shifted by 90 degrees compared to the sine wave compared to the voltage. Um, let's see, one thing to notice here is that this factor of 10 to the sixth came out and that was actually the frequency of this cosine. We'll talk about that more later, but you could, you could see that as, or the frequency of the sine, you could see as the, this frequency changes, right? As this frequency 10 to the sixth changes, if that went to 10 to the fifth, then this would be 10 to the fifth, right? And, and, and this value would change. So the, uh, the current, is dependent upon the frequency of the voltage. And we'll see more about that later. But that's just something to notice. You can imagine making filters because these circuits respond differently to low, ver low frequencies versus high frequencies. Okay. Um, so uh, in your book or anywhere on the internet, you can find how to com combine capacitors in series and capacitors in parallel. I'm not gonna go over that here, but you have a couple exercises, a couple homework problems to work on that. And, and you'll see again, it's just a short, short section. Uh, you can see how to combine capacitors in series and parallel, and, and you'll have to do that. Okay, so let's talk about, any, any questions on, on this? Let's see, so the frequency of the voltage changes the amplitude of the current, that's exactly right. The frequency of the voltage changes the amplitude of the current. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, if you think about that, that's what a filter can do. We'll get more into this, but uh, the filter can allow current to pass or stop current based on frequency of an input signal. Okay. That's just kind of a preview of that. So, Okay, those are capacitors. There's your capacitor intro. intro. You probably saw some of that in, in physics. Uh, let's talk about inductors. So an inductor uh, can be made just from a coil of wire. That's an inductor. Sometimes an inductor has air as a core, as the center. Sometimes it has a ferrite material. Um, they're made different ways, um, but but let's let's talk about what this inductor is doing. When you apply a current I uh, through an, through a coil of wire through an inductor, you actually uh, create a magnetic field around that coil kind of toroidal looking like that. And uh, so for a given amount of current, you have a constant magnetic field formed through that coil and around that coil. Now, if you've ever played with a DC motor or a generator or uh, co a coil of wire and magnets, uh, you probably know or you've probably seen in textbooks that if you move a coil of wire through a magnetic field, uh, you create a voltage, right? Another way of saying that is if you have a time varying magnetic field, a magnetic field whose who's either uh, direction or magnitude changes, you induce a voltage in a coil. So what happens is that if you have a constant current through this inductor, you get a constant magnetic field, there's no voltage induced across that coil. If I try to change that current, that means the magnetic field is going to change. If that magnetic field changes, that's going to cause a voltage to happen across this coil. So the change of current causes a changing magnetic field, which causes a voltage across that coil. And in fact, 
the voltage across that coil is going to oppose the change of current. If the current is flowing and it tries to increase, the voltage is going to be such that it tries to make the current not increase. If the current tries to decrease, the voltage is going to be such that it tries to keep the current flowing and not decrease. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's the behavior of the inductor, and it's all based on the time varying magnetic field through a coil will induce a voltage. Okay, and in this case, the magnetic field is changing because of the current going through the coil. Okay, so um, let's bring this down to the schematic level. Let's abstract this a bit. So there's the schematic symbol. Try it a little more clearly, a little bigger. There's the schematic symbol for an inductor. Uh, let's define a voltage across this inductor, V of T. It's going to be time varying. Let's define a current into this inductor. So the current is drawn into the positive side of the voltage, I of T. Okay. And then we're going to define an inductance, L, for that inductor. And again, it's another proportionality constant, and it's, it depends on the physical properties of the inductor. And so L, we're going to call it the inductance. It's in units of Henry's. YS, not IES, because it's a guy's name. And you'll see values in, in, in you know, component kits, electronics kits like uh, millihenries, uh, microhenries, nanohenries. Okay, so pretty small values. L is dependent upon the number of turns in the coil, uh, the separation of between coils, the diameter of the coil, the core that's inside. So there, there are a lot of variables that go into that. But L, uh, you know, you know, once you have an L for a given inductor, then there's a relationship between I and V. Okay, so for for an inductor, V equals L times di dt. So that is the big takeaway, the big equation. Uh, the one thing to take away from inductors is V equals L di dt. If you have a constant current flowing through an inductor, right, constant current, then the derivative is zero and the voltage is zero. That's consistent with what I said before. If you have a constant current, the magnetic field isn't changing, there's no voltage induced. As soon as you try to change the current, there's going to be a voltage induced. So if I try to increase the current, uh, v is going to be positive. It's going to oppose the change of current. If I try to decrease the current, the derivative is negative. The voltage goes negative. The current's going to the voltage is going to try to keep the current flowing at the same magnitude instead of decreasing. Okay, so um, so that's so that's a big takeaway. Now this is good if you have current and you want to find voltage. If you have voltage and want to find current, there's a there's a, a derivative. I'm sorry, an integral form. Okay, so uh, I of T equals one over L times the integral. And again, you have to pick a start time, some time in the past, integrate to the current time T, and you're gonna integrate voltage. We'll use this dummy variable tau to integrate D tau. And then you have to have the uh, constant for integration. And that's uh, the current at time zero. At that time in the past. Okay. Okay, so that's that is the uh, relationship between voltage and current for an inductor. Let's do an example now and show what happens. And actually, this is going to turn into a practical application. Uh, any questions on inductors before I erase this? Okay, so now uh, let's look at an example.
And so let's suppose that I have a source, 10 volt source. And I connect that to a switch. So the switch opens and closes. It's open now. And I connect that 10 volt source through a switch uh, across an inductor. And uh, let's suppose that that's a, a two Henry inductor. It's a big inductor. And I define a voltage across the inductor. And I define a current associated with that inductor. And uh, let's suppose the switch closes, draw an arrow down here, that switch closes at t equals zero. So time zero, that switch closes. And so uh, now let's find I of t. Well, let's do this. Let's plot here. Let's let's plot this uh, voltage versus time. And so this is V of T. This is T. And so the voltage starts at. I can use another color here. Uh, zero, and the voltage then pops up to ten volts because the switch closes. And we can calculate, we can say that uh, I of T equals, let's, let's, let's do that integral, uh, one over L times the integral of from zero to T, right? And then we need some variable of integration here. We're just gonna call it tau, right? We're, we replace that later with the limits of after we do the integral with the limits of the, the integral, d tau plus i of zero, right? So this is the equation I had on the last slide. Uh, so someone asked, what, what is V in terms of the integral and uh, the tau symbol? So tau is, just, tau is just a time variable that we're going to integrate over. It represents time in seconds. Uh, the, the limits of integration are zero and t. T is the independent variable for uh, for i. So so all we're doing is we're gonna we're gonna take the integral using tau, and then we're gonna use zero and t as the limits of integration. Okay. And and so what you get here is uh, let's see two Henry's one half. Uh, we we have a oops, my whiteboard just dis disappeared. It looks like. Let's start that up again. So we're going to integrate 10, right? And we're going to get 10 tau evaluated at 0 and t, right? Plus i of 0 and i of 0 uh, equals 0, right? So there's no current flowing through that inductor when that switch is open. Okay. So you get 1 half times 10 times tau evaluated at t and 0. So you get 5t. Okay, so that's what I of t is. So I can plot that. And that would look like this. Move that up a little bit, draw another plot under that. This is I of t. So that is a rising current that keeps going on forever and ha has the equation 5t, right? So at one second, you've hit, uh, let's draw that over here, at one second, you've hit five amps. And if you keep that voltage source connected, uh, something bad is probably going to happen. You're, you're either going to hit the limits of the power supply, like this 10 volt supply here, or you're going to 
heat up the coil because it does have a little bit of resistance in it. You're going to heat up the coil when you get so much current that it, it'll burn out. So it's generally not a good idea to take a, a voltage source and apply it across an inductor because uh, the current just keeps climbing. The current just keeps climbing and uh, eventually something will give, either the power supply or, or the inductor will burn out. Okay, so so that that that's the answer. So uh, find I of T. I of T is equal to five uh, T, right? That's I of T. And so I said this was related to a practical application, and the practical application is creating a a high voltage source. Uh, so if you look at what happens here, let's suppose that at at some time, maybe one second, I all of a sudden. Uh, disconnect the switch, I open the switch, okay? So when I open the switch, the current falls to zero as fast as it can, right? Because I open the switch, current can no longer flow. So at that point, let's kind of, let's do the reverse here. Let's look at uh, V equals L di dt, that's an L. If I shut off the current all of a sudden, this, this fall here, the shutting off of current represents a negative infinity slope, right? I mean, I'm just totally shutting off the current all at once. And if I take uh, that slope and I plug it in here, di dt, that would be negative infinity. I, 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 in, in theory, at least, I get negative infinity times two. Um, as the voltage. So the voltage actually has a, a big negative spike in theory down to negative infinity. What really happens is this, that th this circuit wouldn't let negative infinity slope happen because the voltage would get so large across that inductor that as the switch is trying to open, you would see arcing across the terminals. You would get a spark. The voltage would get so big, it would be like a spark plug. Um, the the uh, charge would actually jump the gap between the conductors, between the contacts as they open. So this, in fact, is, is how you can make a spark plug work. Um, you can take a current, let it flow, and then shut it off all of a sudden. If you've ever worked on older cars, you, you know they had, um, they had points. If you work on even current airplanes have points in their magnetos. And the job of the points is to actually open up. And when the points open up, they cause a very steep slope and current, and that causes a big voltage. So the practical application is if you took a, a voltage source and there's some resistance in there too, and you have a, a coil of wire, and we're not gonna talk about transformers, but you can actually take a transformer which has more coils on one side more turns on one side than on the other side, which actually steps up the voltage. And you take a switch, let me put the switch in here. And you have your spark plug and you close the switch and then you open the switch. And then when that switch opens, you actually get a spark. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the practical, a practical application of an inductor. Uh, most times we're using an inductor for this V versus I relationship. And again, we'll get to that when we get to filters and sinusoids, sinusoidal analysis. Okay. And then, so also, I think one of your homework problems has combining inductors in series and parallel. And I'll just refer you to the book. It's a fairly simple topic. So let me know if you have any questions on that. Hey, so any questions on this inductor example? What I'm going to do now is we're going to take inductors and capacitors and combine them and put them in circuits. Okay. Okay, so, so now you should be able to 
uh, to see my screen. Um, and it's showing uh, the, the title first order circuits intro and RC circuit example. So when, when you were dealing with resistive circuits with circuits that had only resistors in them, when a source was turned on or a source was turned off or a switch position changed, voltages and currents could change instantaneously. A voltage across a resistor could go from zero to five volts with a step. Uh, current could fall from five amps to two amps with a step. So you could have step changes, instantaneous changes in voltage and current uh, with resistive circuits. That is not so when you add capacitors and inductors into the circuits because of that derivative. In circuits with capacitors and inductors uh, and resistors, when a source is turned on or a switch changes position, some voltages and currents do not change instantaneously. Okay, And specifically, the voltages and the currents associated with the capacitor and or inductor. And, and the response then is not a step change, it's something else. And we call that response a transient response. You're transitioning from one voltage to another and, and that's a, a transient response. And so that's a, if, you, if I define it, it's a, it's a time varying change of voltage or current that results from a sudden change in the circuit. That sudden change can be a switch change, it could be a source turning on, it could be you pulling a resistor out of the circuit, whatever. It's a sudden change. And there's a, there's a time varying change, it's not instantaneous. And in general, for a circuit that has a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor, we call that an RLC circuit, you get a uh, second order differential equation. It's a second order circuit. So that's what this is showing down here. You have, you have uh, a second order derivative, right? Second derivative, first derivative, the variable itself, and some constants. Um, if, it's, if the circuit just has an R and a C, resistor capacitor, or an R and an L, resistor and inductor, then you get a uh, first order differential equation, and this is a first order circuit. Okay, so these are the circuits that we're going to work with now. Okay, so, um, so now what I want to do is actually work one of these problems. I'm going to show you how to work an RC circuit, and that's going to be an example of how to work uh, any RC circuit, not just the one I show you, or an RL circuit, and we'll also cover an RL circuit. Uh, probably, probably next time, or if we have time this time. So let's go over to the whiteboard. Okay, so let's draw a, a simple RC circuit, right? This is about as simple as you can get, but the solution actually will extend to other problems. So this circuit is going to have a source And it's going to be a DC source, VS. It could be five volts, negative six volts, two volts, whatever. Uh, it's going to have a switch. And it's going to have a resistor. And it's going to have a capacitor. Okay, so I have uh, an R, a C, a switch. And we're going to close that switch at T equals zero and a DC source. And let's suppose that the source voltage is known, the resistor is known, it's like 10 ohms. C is known, it's one microfarad. Um, and, and let's suppose we want to find the voltage across the capacitor, Vc of t. And we care about the voltage uh, before the switch closes and after the switch closes and, it, and what it does over time. Okay, and let's also suppose that the capacitor is initially uncharged. 
So if it's uncharged, it has zero volts across it. Okay, so let's break this problem into two problems. So for uh, T less than zero, so for T less than zero, uh, that's before the switch is closed, you have an uncharged capacitor, and so that problem's easy, VC of T equals zero. Okay, so zero volts. Things get interesting when the switch closes. So for T greater than zero, I'll say greater than or equal to zero, uh, here's what we have to do. And I'll outline these steps in summary after I, after I actually do the steps. But we're going to uh, use KVL and KCL or whatever we can in order to write a differential equation that we have to solve. Okay, and it's the equation of VC of T. And so if I take, uh, if I look at how do I get an equation that has VC of T in it, I can do that by doing this. Let's suppose, uh, let's circle this node. I write a Kirchhoff's current law uh, equation at this node. So I would like to sum this current, I1, uh, with this current, I2, right? Sum the currents, leaving a node, set it equal to zero. Well, what I can do is I can actually uh, use node voltage analysis, sort of, in order to do this. Let me define uh, a ground here. Remember, I didn't change the circuit. All I said is I'm going to reference node voltages with respect to that node now, with respect to that reference node. And that lets me, since I know that VC is between, well, now the ground node and this upper right node, this is now node voltage VC of T up at the top right. Okay, So for T uh, greater or equal to zero, I can say this. I can say, well, let's use node voltage analysis. Remember, the, the switch is closed. So this is VS node voltage on the left side of the resistor, right? This is still VS here because that switch is closed. So I can say that I1 equals, uh, let's see, this voltage minus this voltage over R. Remember that? VC of T minus VS over R. Okay, so that's the current leaving from right to left through the resistor from VC to VS through R, and that's current I1. And, and then I can say, well, the current down through the capacitor, right, I2, well, that's just, that, that's just the equation for the capacitor. That's the current through a capacitor. That's C dVC dt. Okay? So that's the current going from uh, that node down to ground. It's just the current through the capacitor. And now I can write a KVL equation. So KVL would say uh, I1 plus I2 equals zero. Right? Summing the equations, leaving that node. And so now uh, I can substitute in right, these other equations into I1 and I2, and I get VC of T minus Vs over R uh, uh, plus C dVCTT All right, sum the currents leaving the node equals zero. And let me re rearrange this equation a little bit, uh, something a little more friendly for solving. If I can write, so I can write RC, I'm going to multiply both sides by R of this equation and then move the constant off to the right side. So RC times D, VC, DT, uh, plus VC of T equals VS. All right. So there's a differential equation. Uh, R and C are known, VS is known. VC is to be found. So this is a, a, a first order 
differential equation. Now we're to the point where, oh, did I write KCL? Oh, thank you. Yeah, this is not KVL, this is KCL. KCL, Kirchhoff's current law, thank you. So now uh, we're into solving a first order differential equation. That's, that's what we should, that's what we need to do. It turns out that any equation of this form where you have a constant times a, a derivative of a variable plus a constant times the variable you're trying to find equals a constant, any equation of that form, no matter what the constants are, uh, and you have a constant on the right side, the DC value on the right side, that value is going to look like this. So, uh, v VC of T is going to have the form K1 plus K2 E to the ST. It's going to be this kind of exponential solution. You're going to have some number plus some number times E to the some number times T. So we can use that in order to solve this equation. Every, every solution is going to look like that. Every solution to this equation, uh, this form of the equation is going to look like this. So now let's do this. Let's, let's plug in um, k1 plus k2 e to the st into our equation that we found for this specific circuit. OK, let's do that. So I'm going to say r times C times the derivative of the solution, K1 plus K2 E to the ST. That's a T, okay? Plus, so that's this part, plus VC of T, which is K1 plus K2 E to the ST equals Vs. And so now let's take the derivative of, of what's inside uh, these parentheses, parentheses here. So you get uh, R times C times, let's see, K1 goes to zero when you take the derivative. So we get K2 uh, times S, S comes out of the exponential there, E to the ST. plus K1, plus K2, E to the ST equals Vs. So I've just taken the derivative and wrote the rest of the equation out there. And let me rearrange this equation into a very specific form. I want to get this equation into a form where I have a time varying term plus a constant equals a constant. Okay, so let me do this. Let me group together some terms here uh, around e to the st. So I get, uh, let's see, I have k2 in both of these terms. So I get k2 uh, times rcs plus one, right? So this is this term, rc k2 s e to the st. K2 R C S E to the ST, and then uh, K2 times one E to the ST. And then plus K1, I've got the K1 remaining there, equals VS. So I've just rearranged this equation. So we're going to use uh, a little reasoning here to figure this out. I have a term uh, that is, is time varying. Right? By time varying, it means it changes with time. I have an e to the st. As time changes, this whole term changes. So this, this is time varying, time varying. I have a term k2, which is a constant. And I have a term vs, which is a constant. Right? And, and so that should bother you, right? You can't have a time varying term plus a constant equals a constant. I mean, for example, uh, it, it, let me just draw something here. I have some, some term, let's say this time varying term, it, it, it does something. 
Oop, my whiteboard went away. And so this, this time varying term does something. It doesn't do exactly that, but it does something with time. And then you have with time a constant and that you're saying that plus that equals a constant, right? That can't be, you can't add something that changes with time to something that's constant and get a constant, right? So what that means is, is we have to make this go away somehow. We have to make that term go away so you can have a constant equals a constant. Okay, so let me just erase this part of it. So I have to make, I have to make this term go away, right? So this term has to, this term has to go away. I want to make that equal to zero. A couple ways I can do that. I can say, well, um, I could make K2 equal to zero. If K2 is equal to zero, then I have a constant equals a constant. The time varying term goes away. But we know that K2 is not zero because if K2 were zero, then VC would be a constant. VC would, equal to, would be equal to K1 and it wouldn't change. But we know that when we close the switch, we have a capacitor that's at zero volts to start off with, and we have a source over here, and current's going to flow to charge up that capacitor, and as the capacitor charges, VC is going to change. So K2 cannot be zero, because we know the answer isn't DC. So K2 is not equal to zero. It's not e K2 is not equal to zero. So what we're left with is uh, RCS plus one equals zero. Okay, so this remaining term here, in order to make that time varying term goes, go away, has to be zero. So we wind up with uh, RCS plus one equals zero. Okay. Uh, we know R, we know C, we're looking for S. We're looking for K1, K2, and S. So we can solve for S, S equals minus one over RC. So there's one of the three values that we have to find to fill in to this solution, to this equation. Okay. Uh, now we're left with this uh, left term equal to zero, so we know what K1 is. Uh, uh, K1 equals Vs. left with zero plus K1 equals Vs. Okay, so we've solved for S, we've solved for K1. Uh, now what we have to do is solve for K2. And to solve for K2, we need to use an initial condition. Okay, so we're going to use the fact that we know that Vc of zero, let's say zero minus, right before that switch closes, Vc of zero minus equals zero volts. We know the capacitor is is uncharged. We said that, so Vc of zero minus is one volts is, is zero volts. Um, we know that in order to get from zero minus, we have to go through zero and get the Vc of zero plus, right? Somehow we have to we have to get from zero minus to zero plus, and if we collapse those, we get to zero. We also know that I of t for an inductor is equal to uh, uh, for, an, for a capacitor, I of t is equal to C dV dt. Okay. Which means that the voltage across a capacitor cannot change instantaneously. If you, in, in order for a voltage to change instantaneously, you would need infinite current. Okay. So, what that means is that you have to have a smooth transition at zero from zero minus to zero plus. So VC of zero plus must also equal zero volts, right? You cannot have a discontinuity. You can't take a voltage and just jump from zero volts to one volt or zero volts to five volts instantaneously because that would require an infinite derivative and infinite current. Okay, so that can't happen. So we know there's gonna be a smooth transition across zero. So this means that uh, VC of zero 
equals zero volts. Okay, and we're going to use that to find K2. Okay, so uh, what we can say is that uh, VC of zero, right, we're going to go back to this equation up here, uh, is equal to zero, which equals K1 plus K2 E to the ST, which is zero, T is zero. So k one so so we have uh, zero equals k one plus k two e to the zero is one. We have k two equals minus k one. Okay. So k two equals minus v s. And so now we can we can plug this all together. We can plug k one k two and s into this equation. And we can say VC of T equals K1 plus K2 e to the ST. K1 is VS. K2 is minus VS. Uh, e to the ST. S is minus 1 over RC. So you get minus T over RC for T greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so that's the solution right there. So just to kind of, you know, summarize what we did, uh, we wrote a, a an equation for VC. It turned out, and it always will be, to be a first order differential equation. We said the solution to that equation is always going to be K1 plus K2 e to the ST. In fact, if we're looking for a current, it's going to be K1 plus K2 e to the ST also, which is going to have different constants. Um, we we plugged this solution into the equation we derived and we figured out how to solve that by saying well there's a time varying term plus a constant equals a constant so the uh, time varying term has to go away we, we made that go away that gave us k1 and s and then we use the initial condition to solve for k2 okay so let me bring you back to a slide here Okay, so you should be you should be seeing a slide that says first order circuits summary of method to solve. So, in general, when you have a first order circuit, it's an RL or an RC circuit. We'll work an RL circuit next time. Um, you can use any circuit analysis any circuit analysis approach like Kirchhoff's laws, uh, KVL, KCL voltage division, node voltage analysis, whatever, to write a first order differential equation. And you want to write an equation that describes the voltage or current you're trying to find. And so it's going to be of this form. It's going to be a constant times dV dt plus a constant times V of t equals some other constant. Okay. And, uh, and then once you do that, now you have that equation, you substitute in k1 plus k2 e to the st into your first order differential equation. Right, that's going to be the solution all the time to the equation above. Uh, and then you rearrange the equation so that you have a time varying term that will drop out of the equation. And then you solve for S. So, right, you're going to have some time varying term that must go to zero uh, plus a constant equals a constant. And then you solve for K1 using the remaining terms of the equation and then solve for K2 using the initial condition. Okay. So, in general, uh, that's the way. That, that you solve uh, a first order circuit. <clears throat> so uh, what we're going to do is what I want to do, um, let's see. I'm going to hold off on the time constant discussion until next time. We're going to continue on this topic by talking about time constants. They're an important characteristic that describe a transient response. Uh, and then we're going to move on to an RL circuit. We're going to basically do the same thing. It's going to give you another example of a resistor of a first order circuit using a resistor and a capacitor. And 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 then I'm going to kind of sum it all up, and I'm going to show you uh, a potential shortcut approach that uses a seven in equivalent circuit. Right? It's all coming full circle. Uh, it, it, uh, it gives you another way 
uh, sometimes easier to solve these circuits. Okay. Okay, so, so that's all the technical material I'd like to cover for today. Uh, does anybody have any questions on, uh, let's, let's say first order circuits for now, and we'll defer any other questions to office hours. This stuff isn't gonna be on the exam, right? No, the exam will cover through uh, Thevenin equivalence and maximum power transfer. So this will be on the final, but not on the midterm. Cool. Mm -hmm. could, could you possibly go back to the slide um, where you were showing that example uh, and you had solved it? Or was uh, that on the white? Was that on the whiteboard? Oh, it was on the whiteboard. I, uh, in okay. fact, I can I can bring. Let me bring that up. I just want to get another look at that and either screenshot it and write a couple more things down. Sure. Yeah. Let me put that up. Thank you. Sure thing. Okay. Any, any other questions on RC circuits? And again, we'll see another example next time. Okay, um, so kind of some closing remarks. Uh, there are, uh, I think, three assignments uh, posted in preparation for the test. So take a look at those. Uh, you actually have a, a, a homework due tonight, and I think tomorrow. Take a look at the schedule on that. Those are all, we, I want to get those done before the test because of um, uh, preparing for the test. Uh, so also take a look at the review problems, which are old exam problems. There are a few of those out there on Canvas. And then there's a link to a page with practice problems. Those practice problems are problems that I created that bring you from kind of simple examples up to more complex examples. So if you're having any, uh, any, any troubles with any of these topics, take a look at those practice problems. I'd be happy to answer any questions about those. Um, uh, other than that, thanks for joining the live class. And, uh, and as always, let me know what works, uh, what doesn't work, and I will uh, try to improve uh, things, conditions, working remotely as, as much as I can. So we'll, we will stop now, and what I'll do is I'll go on mute for a couple minutes, and uh, anybody who wants to stick around for office hours, please stick around, and uh, you can stop by, you can stick around for office hours to ask questions or listen to other people's questions, and if not, um, I'll see you or hear you or read your chat at the next lecture, okay? So talk to you in a couple minutes.